So if you were paying attention last week, um, you will perhaps know that we heard the first eight verses of John 15, where the focus was on abiding in and with Jesus so that we can be well grafted into the vine of faith. You'll recall, I hope, because it's only been a week, that I suggested that this requires a bit of effort on our part. Pray more, worship more, and give more was the strapline that I proposed. This week we move on to the next section of this really rather crucial bit of teaching from Jesus. Abiding in Christ is once again a focus. But Jesus now expands on his theme to include the topic of love and how we can be in a relationship of love with him. And he says this, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He goes on then to encourage his disciples to love one another just as he has loved them. And he goes still further to say that he no longer thinks of his disciples as servants, but rather now as his friends. Wow. Wow. Let's just pause and think about that for a moment. Jesus, the Lord of the universe, through whom all things were made, wants to call you and even me his friend. Isn't that mind-blowing? What's more, he wants to introduce us to his Father. These concepts, you know, are so far beyond what believers of the time were taught to believe about God that they would have struggled to even grasp the concept of what he's talking about. For the vast majority of religious people at the time of Jesus, God, any God, was a remote, distant, unfathomable mystery. The Jewish understanding of God placed him at a marked distance from human beings, either up a mountain or behind the curtain in the temple in the Holy of Holies, the place that could only be entered once a year on the Day of Atonement by the High Priest. And now here was Jesus, God's Son, saying that he sought not just servants, but friends. Friends. But here we need to sound a note of caution. This is God speaking through Jesus Christ, the, who is saying that he wants to be our friend. But there is a conditionality to that friendship. You are my friends, he says, if you do as I command you. There's a tendency in some quarters of Christianity to regard Jesus in, I think, rather familiar terms. Some of the worship songs of the last century have, in my view, sometimes got a rather mawkish, almost romantic quality to them. As indeed do some Victorian hymns. I'm thinking of what a friend we have in Jesus, for example. Such songs almost, and in some cases actually, sound more like love songs between two human beings than they do worship songs. They are, they are passionate, they are loving, or they are pleading in tone. They kind of lay on with a trowel the concept of love between a creator and creature leading some commentators to cheekily refer to them as Jesus is my boyfriend songs. But we must not over-sentimentalize what Jesus is offering to his disciples in this passage. Friendship with Jesus arrives, arises out of his gracious offer of friendship. He gracefully, mercifully initiates a relationship of friendship with us. Despite all the ways that we fall short of his standards and his teaching, the Lord of the universe reaches down to his creatures 
and offers his hand. But, you know, it's a steel hand in a velvet glove. There is a condition attached. The condition of obedience to his commands. Jesus offers us his friendship, but we have a stark choice to make. We can only be his friends if we keep his commandments. And that, of course, means taking Jesus seriously. Jesus isn't my boyfriend, which is something of what I meant last week when I talked about praying more, worshipping more, or giving more. In some Christian circles, it's possible to get so caught up in the adoration, the love, and the worship of God who offers us friendship and fills us with his spirit that we can forget that with friendship comes conditions. Because you see, how we live our lives matters. If we live with hatred or unforgiveness in our hearts, then we're failing to keep Jesus' commandments. If we live with avarice or greed or jealousy or infidelity, or if we fail to look after the planet that we've been given, then we fall short of the standards that Jesus requires of those he calls friends. Forgive my grandson, he's decided he wants to come over and see me, I think, and he's just not going to shut up till he gets the chance to, is he? <laughs> Let's just give him a, a moment. It's very hard for you to listen to what I'm saying while he's making such a racket. So we'll just let him calm down for a minute. If we fail to care for the poor and for the broken hearted, we cannot call ourselves Jesus' friends. We can't. We just can't. But lest anyone should think that I'm saying that we can earn our place in the kingdom by our own efforts, well, let me be clear. None of us can ever do that. None of us, not even the saintliest amongst us, can hope to be good enough to earn Jesus' friendship. Jesus offers us his friendship despite our failings, out of his love and his grace. He initiates the relationship. But if we accept that friendship, we also accept the obligations that the friendship puts upon us. It's simply not good enough to say, I'm a friend of Jesus, and then to fail to make any significant changes in the way we live our lives. Jesus may have indeed paid the price, but there's still a cost to being a disciple. We may even be called to lay down our lives as did our patron, St. Faith, and most of those first disciples to whom this speech of Jesus' was first addressed. For, he says, no one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. The good news, of course, is that Jesus never stops reaching out his hand of friendship. Even if the velvet glove conceals a steel hand, he's always willing to forgive his friends whenever we fall. He always keeps his hand held out for us to grasp and be drawn upwards. Jesus offers us his love and his friendship. He initiates that relationship by his divine grace and his mercy. All he asks of us is that we follow him, live like him, and obey his life-giving, world-changing commandments. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen.